There are those who say that fact is stranger than fiction. Science is stranger than art. Little is stranger than large. <laughs> are they correct? Today, the extraordinariness of space has become ordinary. In London, as we're here tonight, a person is frequently closer in miles to the International Space Station than they are to Newcastle. Regrettably, this makes the International Space Station seem less glamorous rather than Newcastle more glamorous. <laughs> to launch mankind into the space age, the early rocket pioneers put aside conventional notions of the acceptable. They turned away from everyday fears of the unusual, the peculiar, the downright rum, and reached out instead to the strange, the unpopular, to that which makes a mockery of natural laws. What would that be like? Please welcome Helen Keane with It Is Rocket Science. Hello. In this series, we'll be taking a low-budget, highly subjective look at the history and future of space travel. Helping me will be the voice of space. Hello. <laughs> A synthetic narrator I created by feeding all the most desirable statistics of a space professional into my Woolworths laptop and then hacking a secret government computer for extra power during a mysterious electrical storm. Almost exactly like in that film Weird Science. <laughs> Only I haven't been able to use my mysterious electronic slash supernatural powers to find you a boyfriend. Yet. Still time. Still time. <laughs> From its earliest days, space travel was about making incredibly unlikely things happen. Some people claim that space travel is impossible, a lie, that mankind could never leap beyond the magic circle of Earth's atmosphere. But then often, those same people claim that our world is controlled by lizard men from another dimension who lurk disguised behind the fleshy curtains we know as our leaders. For example, Barack Obama and Princess Anne. But why the conspiracy theories? Perhaps because space travel seems so wonderfully far-fetched. But perhaps also because there were secrets, there were cover-ups, and, as you will see, the pioneers were particularly peculiar. If, in some unusually geekily niche version of Family Fortunes, we asked about 100 people to name a famous rocket scientist, most would probably say... The notorious ex-Nazi German rocket genius Werner von Braun? Affirmative. Werner von Braun, Werner von Braun. I've never been quite sure, but then as my friend John said the other day, if only they'd won the war, then we'd all know. <laughs> von Braun was inspired by the work of the three fathers of modern rocket science from episode one, particularly of his countryman, Hermann Oberth. And like Oberth, he was so obsessed with achieving his goals that he joined with the Nazis to realise his rocket dream in the creation of a super weapon, the deadly V2 rocket. 2,200 pounds of Amatol explosive aboard a ballistic missile. Each one a silent killer, powered by 30 tons of potato. Just to clarify, 30 tons of potato distilled into fuel alcohol. They weren't mashing them or anything. The V2 was the first man-made object to achieve spaceflight, albeit suborbital spaceflight, meaning it didn't travel all the way around the Earth. On 8th September 1944, the first rocket fired at England took off in Nazi-occupied Netherlands and hurtled towards London at four times the speed of sound. An occasion von Braun marked by saying, The rocket worked perfectly, apart from landing on the wrong planet. <laughs> yeah, because that's such an easy mistake to make, isn't it? Oh, the Death Star worked perfectly against Alderaan. Only we were actually aiming at Northampton. <laughs> but to return to this planet The year is 1945 The war is over But the Cold War is just beginning Like squabbling schoolboys Searching for an ever more powerful pea shooter America and Russia hunt for new means To reach each other with their weapons Their shooter will be the rockets Created by the Nazis Their pea will be the atomic bomb And the poor curious elderly cat Who is inevitably about to lose an eye is the whole of the world. <laughs> At the end of the war, most of the Nazi rocket scientists surrendered to the Americans. This is still a very dark period in US history. The German rocket scientists were taken back to the US in a secret and highly controversial operation known as Operation Paperclip. Why Paperclip, you may ask? I'm not entirely sure, but I think maybe when they were trying to decide what to do with the Nazi rocket scientists, a little animated figure popped up in the corner <laughs> and said... 
It looks like you're trying to spirit away some space Nazis before anyone mentions Nuremberg. Can I help with that? Von Braun was the key figure taken to America in Operation Paperclip, and he has quite an odd career trajectory. In Germany, he's an officer in the evil SS, but then he moves to America and totally reinvents himself as a children's television presenter for Disney. <laughs> that must have been quite an odd CV to get. <laughs> And it does sort of put John Leslie in perspective. <laughs> but really, Werner von Braun introduced a generation of young American Disney viewers to the uh, wonders of space. Welcome, children at home. Say hello, Mickey. Oh, hello. Say hello, Donald. <laughs> Say hello, Werner. Sieg ha ha! <laughs> Hello, children! <laughs> ah, ignore that! <laughs> Many people still believe that America owes its ultimate success in the space race to the evil genius of Werner von Braun. But von Braun gave an interview in the late 1960s <laughs> in which he paid tribute to the defining achievements of another early rocket scientist and innovator, this time an American, a man named John Whiteside Parson. Now, I can imagine the NASA PR people breathing a huge sigh of relief here, as few. John Whiteside Parsons doesn't sound like a Nazi, does he? Oh, no. John Whiteside Parsons, or Jack Parsons, as he's better known, certainly was not a Nazi. No, Jack Parsons was a really keen, really enthusiastic Satanist. <laughs> really? It's well documented that prior to his many early rocketry experiments, he would insist on performing a solemn ceremony to appease the horned god Pan. I'm not entirely sure why. Roger that, Houston. Uh, someone's upset a wood nymph, and Pan is furious. Uh, <laughs> we'll need to appease him before we can restart the countdown over. Jack Parsons' mentor was the occultist Alistair Crowley, described by the press at the time as the wickedest man in the world. He was committed to practising magic, which he spelt with a K, to distinguish it from stage magic, though I imagine there were one or two other differences. I don't really remember ever seeing Paul Daniels on TV saying... And now, Debbie McGee will bring forth the bloody offering. <laughs> the Lord of Darkness may like to slake his demoniacal thirst. Not a lot, but he'll like it. <laughs> Two very important things you should know about Jack Parsons. The first is that he was a genius. He was one of the founders of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he totally game-changed the use of solid rocket fuel by introducing a chemical that no-one had thought to use before, potassium perchlorate. That's the first thing. And the second thing you should know about Jack Parsons is that he spent his free time using sex magic, more magic with a K... Oh, Debbie! <laughs> ...to sire a moon child. Mm. He tried and indeed failed to do this using a ceremony called the Babylon Working. Babylon was spelled B-A-B-A-L-O-N, which, to me, begins to suggest that one of the key qualifications for being a Satanist and one of the key elements of Satanism is poor spelling. <laughs> really, there's a lot we can't include on Radio 4 about Jack Parsons, uh, so I would urge you to Google him. But don't bother looking on the NASA website, because they have just one line about him, missing a singular opportunity to make rocket science way more interesting to high school students everywhere. They describe him only as a self-taught chemist. <laughs> so the great American dream of space travel was aided by a collaboration between two sinister forces. The terrifying reality of Nazism. And the frankly made-up nonsense of Satanism. <laughs> it really is no wonder that there were rumours of secret plans and sinister organisations. And you may find yourself thinking, Nazis, Satanists, working together. Haven't I seen that somewhere before? Yes, you have, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> and that didn't end well for them. So what did the Americans do with this arcane knowledge? In 1947 the U.S. launched a converted V-2 rocket 100 miles into the upper reaches of the atmosphere to study the effects of high-altitude radiation. On board were the first living things to boldly go to the very edges of space. Who were these noble beasts, their fragile hearts beating for all creation as they carried the hopes and dreams of a superpower into the blazing Occidental skies? Who were they? They were some flies. <laughs> Does anyone know the name of the first fly in space? No, exactly. I imagine the second one was Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> so, I think everyone knows about Laika, the first dog to be sent into orbit. What you may not know is that one country decided to send cats into space. 
That was the fringe. <laughs> the first fringe space cat was called Felix. Bonjour, je m'appelle Felix. They have sent me into the space, mes oignons. But I do not like it here, pas du tout. What can I see out of my fenêtre de l'espace? Hmm. Is that some garlic for me to eat? No. Is it a lady for me to aller faire la mort to? <laughs> no. Zut, hello, it is an asteroid. There are no ladies in space. There is no garlic. There is no national policy of protectionism benefiting local cheesemakers. <laughs> Up here, it is mad. <laughs> I think I will fulfill my two-dimensional and perhaps slightly offensively stereotypical destiny in this sketch by going on the strike. <laughs> As I say, the first French space cat was Felix, but unfortunately, just before the launch, Felix ran away. He was very hard to find because he looked just like any other stray cat, apart from the large transmitter on his forehead linked to the electrodes wired directly into his feline brain. So, the actual first French space cat was apparently a female called Felicette, which is rather confusing. Hello? Uh, I'm a female space cat now? Bof! I will maintain my stereotype by gazing scornfully through the portal at your very own chic clothes and singing the powerful French ballads. The planet Earth is blue and there's rien I can do. <laughs> Ah, the early days of space travel, with roots that fed on the stuff of science fiction and comic books and an undulating metallic beanstalk that carried us up to the moon. But as Arthur C. Clarke once wrote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Though I think he meant magic without a K. <laughs> Why make things up when everything on the table was so odd already? When even the simplest details need to be looked at from all the oddest angles. For instance... When the lunar module was being designed, scientists genuinely considered solving the problem of carrying food into space by making parts of it edible. <laughs> Flavoursome fuel tanks and transparent sugar windows so that the astronauts could break bits off to eat on the way home like some semi-palatable space-faring gingerbread house. This is one small step for man. <laughs> one giant Mouthful for me. <clears throat> the actual tiny details of what might have happened, what could have happened, and what actually happened are so much more interesting than the idea that none of it happened at all. Conspiracy theory is whitewash over the vivid colours of a true story. The early days of rocket science. Strange foundations that were laid for a fantastical structure. A story that is horrifying and difficult and funny and surreal <laughs> and happy and heartbreaking. <laughs> the strangeness of space, perhaps strangest of all, is that when you've looked at the Earth from 238,857 miles away, the smallest ordinary things, when they come back into focus again, become extraordinary. Here's Apollo 12 astronaut Al Bean on returning to the Earth from space. Since that time, I have not complained about the weather one single time. I'm glad there is weather. I've not complained about traffic. I'm glad there are people around. One of the things I did when I got home, I went out to shopping centers. And I just go around there, get an ice cream cone or something, and just watch the people go by and think, boy, we're lucky to be here. Why do people complain about the earth? We're living in the Garden of Eden. Thank you very much, and goodbye. It is Rocket Science, starred Helen Keane, Peter Serafinowicz, and Susie Kay. It was written by Miriam Underhill and Helen Keane. The producer was Gareth Edwards.